Thank you to my friends in Birmingham, um, the wonderful Waterstones. Um, I'm Jeffrey Deaver. I'm from America. I've been writing novels now for almost um, 45 years. I've written 37 novels, roughly 80 short stories, um, a number of poems. I've written a teleplay. I wrote a radio play starring Alfred Molina. Um, I have written uh, an album of country western songs. I um, am in the process of writing a book about writing. And as part of that book, I have taken uh, quotations from a number of other authors, far more articulate and intelligent than I, and I include them in uh, chapters that roughly track the, the chronological process of creating a book. And I, I do add my comments at the end. And so what I thought I'd do uh, with, uh, with you this evening is to share portions of these chapters, not all of them, but um, give you some quotations from authors so that if you are writers, potential writers, or you're simply uh, uh, fascinated with these miraculous little things we call books, I hope you find these comments helpful. My first chapter is called Why Write? Why do we engage in this crazy process of writing books? William Sapphire said this, I write because I enjoy expressing myself and writing forces me to think more coherently than I do when I'm just shooting off my mouth. Reynolds Price said this, I write because it's the only thing I'm really very good at in the whole entire world and I've got to stay busy to keep out of trouble. Jonathan Safran Foer said this, why do I write? It's not that I want people to think I'm smart or even that I'm a good writer. I write because I want to end my loneliness. Books make people less alone. That before and after everything else is what books do. They show us that conversation is possible across distance. Now why do I write? I write essentially because I was a nerd. I had no talent for sports. I was uniformly ignored by cheerleaders and pom-pom girls. And I was drawn to reading and drawn to writing. I like telling stories. Stories have been around for thousands of years. They uh, vastly predated novels, of course. Um, but there's something more important to stories that I found important. Remember back to men when maybe you were the new kid at the schoolyard, or you had uh, lived in the neighborhood for a long time and saw a new kid on the schoolyard. And you or they were very shy, of course, as children often are. But suddenly you notice that that kid may have had under his arms a copy of The Hobbit. And that gave you an excuse to sidle up to him and look at him shyly and say, hmm, pretty good book, huh? And suddenly his eyes opened a little bit and he said, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you get to the part about Smog the dragon? And then you'd say, yeah, wasn't that cool? And suddenly, even though you did not know that person, suddenly, yes, you did know him. Books provided that commonality that brought you together, as books still do. I knew then that I wanted to write uh, for a living. And this goes back to when I was eight or nine years old. So that's chapter one, why write? All writers have different answers. These are some of them. Chapter two, finding a subject to write about. Francine Matthews said this, I always heard write what you know. I disagree. You should write what you love. You can always research the rest. Stephen King said writers remember everything especially the hurts. Strip a writer to the buff, point to the scars, and he'll tell you the story of each small one. From the big ones, you get novels. A little talent is a nice thing to have if you want to be a writer, but the only real requirement is the ability to remember the story of each small scar. Meg Cabot, author of The Princess Diaries, said this, write the kind of story you would like to read. People will give you all sorts of advice about writing, but if you're not writing something that you like, no one else will write it either. Francine Matthews again, don't write to fill the gap in the market. It'll be gone by the time you get there. For my sake, I um, uh, look for ideas that will simply scare the hell out of you. I can't put it any other way than that. I, um, in the case of The Steel Kiss, my latest book from Hotter and Stoughton, um, once you uh, read that book, you will never, ever get on an escalator or elevator again. Thank goodness we're only on the first floor. You can walk down. Uh, but the killer in that book uses uh, modern consumer products 
and uh, household and industrial items as weapons. He, he hacks into the smart controller. You know, these new products have these, these microchips with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in them that communicate to the cloud. Well, if you are on holiday and you think, oh my goodness, did I shut the range off? I'm going to log on, honey, and find out. And you do, and you learn that you did shut the range off. That's wonderful. Just remember, someone else can hack in and turn the range on when you're not home. And he may shut the pilot light off first so that you come home to a house filled with gas. Luckily, you live long enough to call the fire department. <laughs> These are ideas I look for. Mickey Spillane said people don't read books to get to the middle. Think about it. We don't pick up a 500-page book saying, I cannot wait to get to page 250 and put it down because it's boring. No, we want to get from the first page to the last page propelled as quickly as we can. Those are the ideas I look for. Chapter three, planning the novel. Gustave Flaubert said, books aren't made the way babies are made. They're not made the way babies are made. They're made like architects build pyramids. There's some long pondered plan and then great blocks of stone are placed one atop the other and it's backbreaking, sweaty, laborious work. Joyce Carol Oates, the first sentence cannot be written until the final sentence is written. Ernest Hemingway said, writing is architecture, not interior decoration. Well, I believe in what these authors have said. I plan everything out ahead of time. I do not get on a, an airplane that has not been built according to tried and true design specifications. I don't get in a car that hasn't been built according to blueprints. Why should I read a book where the author says, eh, I don't know what to do. I'm going to just throw stuff here, throw stuff there. I spend eight months outlining my books full-time job w along with the research so it's not completely full-time but it occupies the bulk of those eight months at the end of that period the outline will be roughly 150 pages long I will know when every clue is seeded into the book because as you know if you've read my books I like my surprise endings and endings plural three or four surprise endings and those clues have to be set up very carefully I know when every character is introduced into a book and no one just vanishes in my book unless I kill them. That's completely legitimate, but I explain their departure from the novel. You have to do that. Everything has to be highly choreographed. We need the reversals to work. There can be no give me a break moments where you slap your head and say this just falls apart. If you outline, that's not going to happen. Now there's another reason for doing an outline aside from structuring your story, and that's this. You don't have to raise your hands, but has anyone here ever read a book that should not have been written? Yes, I'll answer for you. I know you have. Just because you have an idea and a word processor does not mean that that book has to see the light of day. If you sit down with a very good uh, set piece beginning, you know, a big Hollywood action opening that could be very exciting, and you write that from prose, not knowing where the book is going to go, and you come to chapter three, four, five, six, suddenly you start to think, I'm not sure what's going to be in the middle of the book, the dreaded middle of your novel. And you have no idea what's going to be on the other side, that is the end, which should be the most important part of a book. Think about it. I mentioned airplanes before. The landing is, to me, the most important part of the flight, right? You want a successful landing. A successful ending is the most important part of the book. But you're staring at those pages you've written, maybe two, three hundred pages of very good prose. And you don't know where the middle is going to go. You don't know what the ending is. You realize that you don't have a book here. You have two choices. The intellectually honest thing, the moral thing, throw it all out and start over again. Or you cheat. You fill in a, a cliche-ridden middle. You put on a deus ex machina ending uh, that is not organic to the story. You put it out in the stream of cons commerce, and we have done a disservice to you, the readers. Um, you pay a lot of money. You spend a lot of time reading our books. We cannot afford to give you anything less than the best. But now, think about an outline. Let's say you work for a couple weeks, not writing beautiful prose, jotting down notations about where the story is going to go. After two weeks, three weeks, even a month, you realize there's no middle. There's no end. This is a book that should not be written. You wad up 30 pages of outline, throw it out, you start over again. There's no emotional investment in that. 
Um, I've done both, and believe me, it's very hard to throw out those pages. You're so tempted to produce a mediocre product and just put it out there and get it over with. You can't do that. An outline helps you make sure that you give the readers the best you possibly can. Now that we've outlined the book, we have our schematic, we know where it's going to go. Now we look at chapter four, which is writing the book. Nathaniel Hawthorne said, a writer's words should dissolve into pure thought. That means that when a reader looks at a paragraph and sees pyrotechnic prose, beautiful style, words thrown upon others like beautiful diamonds and gems, they read it and they say, oh, that's breathtaking. I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but it's breathtaking. No, you have to know what the reader is thinking. You have to take your thoughts as a writer and make sure that goes right into the reader's head. When I was uh, taking a writing course years ago, many, many years ago, you'll know when I tell you this, the um, professor, uh, school uh, teacher, I was in high school, the, the teacher said, never use a 25 cent word when a nickel word will do. Nowadays, those are coins. I don't know, we even, don't even have those in America anymore. They don't mean anything. Now you would say, use a 10 pound word when a one pound word would work. Don't be overly flowery. Keep it simple. Stephen King said this, any word you have to hunt for in a thesaurus is the wrong word. Dr. Seuss, the wonderful literary philosopher, said this, it has often been said there's so much to be read, you can never cram all those words in your head. So the writer who breeds more words than he needs is making a chore for the reader who reads. That's, my, that's why my belief is, the briefer the brief is, the greater the sigh of the reader's relief is. And that's why your books have such power and strength. When you publish with shorth, shorth is better than length. Stephen King, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Ernest Hemingway, if you want to send a message as a novelist, go to Western Union. Richard Price, you don't write about the horrors of war. You write about a kid's burnt sock in the middle of the road. John Steinbeck, if you're using dialogue, say it aloud as you write. Stephen King, I believe that the first draft of a book, even a long one, should take no more than three months. Any longer than that, and for me at least, the story begins to take on an odd foreign feel, rather like a dispatch from the Romanian Department of Public Affairs. For myself, once the outline is done, I can write very quickly. I write in a non uh, pyrotechnic prose. I'm, I was a journalist for many years. I was an attorney for many years. And despite what you think about attorneys, and I'm sure we all have opinions, as I do, uh, communication is part of the game. And we needed to write very precisely and, and concisely. Uh, I will do a 133,000 word manuscript in uh, roughly two months. Uh, maybe a little over that. I bang things out quickly. And because I have the outline, I do not have to write the book in chronological order. I uh, can write the ending at the beginning. I can write the uh, beginning whenever I want. I may wake up, the sun is shining, birds are singing. I look at the outline. I'm supposed to write a murder scene that day. I don't feel like it. I'm happy. It's a nice, warm, warm day. So we've talked about writing the book itself. Let's talk about uh, chapter five now, editing and revising the book. Ernest Hemingway said, there are no great writers, there are only great rewriters. Elmore Leonard said, if it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. Stephen King, when your story is done, you have to cut it to the bone, get rid of every ounce of excess fat. This is going to hurt. Revising a story down to the bare essentials is always a little like murdering children, but it must be done. I like to think he's referring to the must be done part as revising your book, but it is Stephen King we're talking about. As for myself, I rewrite 50 times. I do 50 rewrites on the computer. Um, I, I'm, I say 50, it starts out being very massive rewrites as I get further toward the uh, end of the process. I shrink it down considerably. Then I do 50 rewrites on the printed page because, and this is not anecdotal, it's, I, I'm convinced it's true. We perceive a story differently on the screen than we do from when we read on paper. 
we see things, not only typos, but we, we get tonal differences. We see phrases that don't fit together, wrong word choices, even if they're technically correct, on paper that we don't see on the screen. This is true about ebooks as well. I own a Kindle. I uh, travel a great deal. I can't carry five, six, seven, eight books with me physically. I'm just not strong enough for that. And I also have, you know, 20 days of clothing to carry with me. Uh, so it's helpful in those circumstances. I also uh, like instant gratification. Maybe I'm reading a review of a book at the airport. I have 10 minutes to get on the airplane. I can download it and read it there on the plane. But I will buy the paper copy too because I like paper copies of books. Um, therefore, if you're revising, you don't have to do 50, 100 times like I do, but I would strongly recommend reading it first on the computer, because you may have to move whole chapters around, you may have to search and replace a character name, but once that's done, print it out, read it carefully, edit, make your changes, print it out again, keep going until you're happy with the book, and set it aside for as often as you can. Uh, maybe um, take a week off, do something else, go back, revise, uh, wait another week, revise again. If you can get a month in, that's even better. The longer we wait between revisions and the more often we revise, the better the book will be. Chapter six is the subject we have to deal with as writers. It's called Writer's Block. Jack London said, you can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. Terry Pratchett said, there's no such thing as writer's block. That was invented by people in California who can't write. <laughs> Douglas Adams, I love deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they go by. Larry Kahaner, I don't believe in writer's block. Do doctors have doctor's block? Do plumbers have plumber's block? No, we all have days when we don't feel like working, but why do writers turn it into something so damn special by giving it a faintly romantic name? As for myself, I agree with all of those writers. There is no such thing as writer's block. There is, however, idea block. And this ties into what I had said before about the outline. Let's say you come to that point in the outlining process, because now nobody here is going to just start writing a book right? You're all, all writers here and potential writers, you're all going to start with an outline. Let's say you come to that middle part and you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what the ending's going to be. And you give it a fair shot. You give it a month or so trying to figure it out. And then you come to the realization that no, there's no idea there. Then you're blocked. But you should be blocked because there's no book there. Throw it out. Your ideas are blocked, not your writing ability. Anybody in here can write a book. I guarantee it. You can go home tonight and start on a book. You have to have an idea, and you need an idea that works. And once you come up with that idea, then you can move forward and tell your story. Chapter 7 is about critics and rejection. Sebastian Junger said this, I wrote my first novel in seventh grade, longhand in, green, in a green composition notebook. My teacher read it aloud to the entire class. No wonder I didn't have any friends. Neil Gaiman. Remember, when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them in one of your books, they are almost always right. When they tell you how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. David Mitchell. If you show somebody something you've written, what you're doing is giving them a sharpened stake. You're lying down in your coffin and saying to them, whenever you're ready. Saul Bellow, I discovered that rejections are not altogether a bad thing. They teach a writer to rely on his own judgment and to say in his heart of hearts, to hell with you. Myself, I've had hundreds of rejections. I think it could almost be thousands. In fact, I had one recently, which was a little unusual because I kind of have my chops down now. But I uh, submitted a short story and got a call back from the editor of the publication who's published much of my work before. And she said, well, Jeffrey, I feel very awkward about this. My lawyer is on the other line. And it turned out that I um, had incorporated a character, a fictional character, into my short story who could easily have been identified with a person involved in American politics at the moment, whose name I am not going to mention. 
and it was felt that there might be some legal action occurring. And while I do feel that it would have been good publicity, believe me, there is such a thing as bad publicity. So I decided to err on the side of caution and take that individual's name out. And uh, you may guess who I'm talking about. I'm not dare going to say it because I've got two or three cameras running right here. But um, that was rejected. I revised it and it was then published. Uh, rejection is simply a part of the game. I say this, uh, don't let rejection stop you. Rejection is a speed bump. It's not a brick wall. If you have a certain desire to write, you can write. One of my first books, rejected by every publisher in New York, I set aside, three years later, was purchased almost identical uh, word for word from the one that was rejected by a publisher that had rejected it in the first time. Um, editorial work is very subjective. What one editor likes, another editor hates. Just keep that in mind. Keep your head down, keep writing. If you can't sell book one, move on to book two, but don't throw out book one. Remember that. Chapter eight is a humorous interlude. Famous rejection letters. I'm sorry, Mr. Kipling, but you simply don't know how to use the English language. Your poems are quite as remarkable for defects as for beauties and are devoid of true poetical qualities. Emily Dickinson. It would be an extremely rotten taste to say nothing of being cruel to publish this novel to Ernest Hemingway. Overwhelmingly nauseating, I recommend that this manuscript be buried under a rock for a thousand years. Nabokov's Lolita. I'm sorry, it is impossible to sell animal stories in the United States. Yes, George Orwell's Animal Farm. Um, this book will set publishing back 25 years. Norman Mailer's Dear Park. For your own sake, I pray God you do not publish this book, D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. You're welcome to Mr. Le Carre. He's going nowhere in this business. You'd have a decent book if you got rid of that Gatsby character. And my all-time favorite. First, sir, we must ask, does it have to be a whale? Yes, a true rejection letter to Herman Melville about Moby Dick. Well, lest, uh, lest some of these insights and quotations have discouraged you from ever becoming a writer, I want to um, uh, <laughs> make sure we have the uh, light at the end of the, the, the tunnel. And um, I have chapter um, 10, the, the joy of writing. Truman Capote said this, to me, the greatest pleasure, and great it is indeed, is not necessarily in what a book is about. It's the music the words make when you put the notes of words together. Ray Bradbury, I've never worked a day in my life. I'm a writer. Julie Meyerson, writing gives me such enormous pleasure, and I'm a much happier person when I'm doing it. Writing feels like something I simply could not live without. It's a joyous thing. I feel very lucky to be paid to do it. But even if I'd never been published, I know I would still be writing. Well, these are just a, a very fraction of the many thoughts uh, writers have shared about the craft of telling stories. We see how varied these authors are, how varied we know the works they create are, how separated in time and geography and sensibility they are. But if we step back, we see one thing they all have in common, and the one thing that generated the reason for saying things like this, and that's the passionate desire they have to reach into the hearts and minds of readers and make them laugh or cry or make them scream out loud in terror or make them better understand this crazy world we live in. And in doing so, make our time here a little saner, a little richer, and frankly, a little more fun. And if you want to, you can quote me on that. And uh, thank you all for coming. Good seeing you all. <laughs>